Okay. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, good morning, everyone. It's really nice uh, to be in such a beautiful place. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, is gravitational waves. So it's a little five uh, lesson introduction to gravitational wave, which of course cannot be complete or exhaustive. But uh, the idea is to give you the basic to understand uh, some of the old and current and future observations. Um, I'll skip uh, <coughs> most of the time, I hope to skip most of the calculation, so to get quickly to the concepts and um, um, the ideas. Um, but I will uh, uh, point you, and you will have available lecture notes where you see some of this calculation. Other calculation, you simply have to uh, be um, strong enough and, uh, you know, just try to do it by yourself, but hopefully this, is, this will be helpful. And so what are gravitational waves? Uh, well, gravitational waves, one way we will define them properly or better during today and tomorrow, but essentially are uh, wave-like solutions to Einstein equations. This is the short, uh, the, sh the short rough definition. Some people say ripples in space-time. It's kind of another equivalent rough definition. And, um, <coughs> Well, they were identified in his own theory already by Einstein in um, 1916 and 18. There are three papers where it kind of first say, oh, there, you know, there, there are gravitational waves, they are real. Then he says, no, not really. But then um, he actually uh, arrives to um, say, yes, they are there and they are real. Uh, it's interesting to read this paper. Um, but they have been, and that's interesting for us and for you that are uh, the theoretical people, um, we had to wait the 50s um, to have these waves on solid uh, ground and reasonably understood mathematically. And here I highlight two things that happens in the 50s by many people. Just here some names just to guide you, but you find again the references there. So one important result uh, that happened in the 50s is a result by um, Shoke Bruhat. They studied the GR as initial value problem, as a Cauchy problem. Uh, and indeed identifies um, wave-like solutions in that sense, and these are well posed, and so on and so forth, um, together with others that had previous results, but she really did the, the breakthrough. And another important thing that happened um, in the 50s with a number of people, by a number of people, Bondi, Sachs, Penrose, many others, um, is the study of, of um, the asymptotic space-time, uh, in particular null infinity, understanding of that, um, and also, this is related to the fact that uh, uh, this uh, led us to the fact to understand that gravitational we carry energies, so the definition of energy, and so on and so forth. And this is thanks to these mat mathematical relativity um, uh, type of papers, which are very interesting. They are hard to read, but I'll summarize the main things um, in this in this this lectures. So the topics that we try to we will try to um, Look at, not today, but tomorrow, we will start with the standard approach um, to gravitational waves, which is going the weak field, perturbation on Minkowski and studying linearized, uh, linearized theory, linearized general relativity. This is something that some of you may already have seen, probably all of you. Um, then we will discuss uh, these concepts of gravitational wave energy. I'll mention some of the results here. Uh, of Bondi and Perros and others, and the stress energy tensor for gravitational wave, which is kind of complicated conceptual thing. And I hope to have time um, to continue in the final lecture, say something, not really do all the formals, but say something about the post-Newtonian formalism, or PM from now on, which is an important ingredient um, to study self-gravitating sources of gravitational waves or the main, if you want, the main analytical approach to study self-gravitating sources. And another topic very important are perturbation of spherical symmetric space-time, like Schwarzschild, for example, which is also very important to understand the phenomenology of the observation and what is happening, and what is happening with the, with the data that we now see. So um, let me jump to some of the most important observations, and we start we start long ago. 
um, in the 70s. So this is a famous plot that I think many of you have seen. So it's the Halsen Taylor pulsar. And what you see, uh, it's the observation of the Halsen Taylor pulsar. And what you see in the, uh, what is in this plot is the observation, the observational time and the measure of the, uh, uh, of the periastron uh, decay, okay? If there's an orbit, so what is the source? The source is a binary system with two neutron stars, one of which is a pulsar, which means um, it has magnetic field around and it, it, it emits uh, pulses of electromagnetic field that go uh, to the observer, and the companion is on, uh, they are within an elliptic orbit, and so every time um, kind of there is a passage, you see a pulse, okay? And so you can measure this pulse, and you can measure the period of this, uh, um, of this orbit, and what you find out is that this period actually uh, decay, which means it's not a standard, um, or uh, Kepler type of orbit, but you have a tiny decay and the orbit shrinks, okay? Kind of this way. And this was an effect that was predicted um, in GR, the first, uh, a, a calculation is a standard calculation by Peters and Matthews. These are actually two papers, uh, 63. This is something that you will be doing during the exercises. Um, it's the simplest calculation and it's an heuristic calculation that assumes uh, the energy balance equation and basically says that, uh, well, this is the heuristic argument. If there is a certain energy emitted by gravitational wave, then this energy has to come um, from the orbit and has to be subtracted from the orbit. So this is called the energy balance equation. And it's heuristic, it's not general relativity, it's an heuristic argument. But basically it tells you that, well, if I'm emitting, if I'm emitting gravitational waves, um, then the energy has to go away, and then this is, has to be at the price of the orbital energy, so the orbit must shrinks, which also means, if you think about Kepler law, that a smaller radius uh, has a higher frequency or as a higher frequency. Um, and so this thing increases and we will see that the emission of gravitational wave also increases with the frequency. So it's kind of catastrophic or dissipative uh, system that will lead certainly to, this, to, the, to, to the merger of these two stars, okay? This is exactly, exactly what uh, it, has been uh, it, it has been observed, okay? And just to give you some uh, numbers, um, here, um, well, this is a highly eccentric orbit. It's about uh, uh, 0.6 of eccentricity. Um, you can observe the period, of course, and the period is, Two seven nine oh eight second, and you can make a general relativity test. Uh, sorry, you can um, um, yeah, you can test general relativity. So if you calculate, if you uh, if you observe the changing rate. Of, um, of the period, and you compare to the prediction of general relativity. This is a, predi a prediction that depends on two observational parameters, which, which are called omega ops observed and gamma observed. <coughs> so one is the um, one is the secular rate of the peri periastron advance, and one is a parameter that includes Doppler and gravitational redshift, but it's not, it's not very important here. So you can, um, um, you, can you can measure this and calculate this, and the first measurement gave 1.3 plus minus 0.3, which is a test 
of the fact that general relativity as a quadrupolar structure and propagates a finite speed. And now I explain why. Um, so this is a first experimental constraint on, um, on the theory, uh, but this was the early result. So now it's two order of magnitude better. And why I'm saying that uh, this tests the uh, fact that the uh, general relativity is a, a quadrupolar and propagates a finite speed? Well, the reason is that uh, the formula for P dot GR is essentially comes from the quadrupole formula um, derived by Einstein and that we will also derive today. And the quadrupole formula, uh, in, 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 uh, and yeah, the quadrupole formula is a direct fact that um, is, a, is a direct consequence of the fact that general relativity is uh, as a quadrupolar structure and, um, uh, and, and propagates at finite speed. In fact, as I said, you can calculate this P dot GR uh, using this balance, the, the balance law or energy balance as Peters and Matthew did. Uh, but this actually has been proved uh, by Thibault de Moore later on that um, in a consistent way, so without this heuristic argument, um, the quadrupole formula is true to uh, a certain post-Newtonian level and um, it just enters automatically from the non-linearities and the finite propagation of, uh, of, um, of gravity. Okay, okay more... Uh, more test about that. Uh, so these pulsar are quite, maybe many of you know, but these pulsar are quite a, a amazing system. Um, you can do um, several tests of, of general relativity. Uh, I, think, uh, I think if you are interested, we can discuss further, um, but let me, let me go on. For, for the moment, this is the result that we are interested in, and this is in particular the formula that um, you'll be there deri deriving and, and, and look at that during the lectures. We make a, there, there are other, there are other uh, binary system uh, with neutron stars, with pulsars inside, so there are many systems that you can do these games. Uh, there is even triple system, so there's an entire literature and, and things related to that. Okay? And they have given very, very stringent tests of, of general relativity so far. The very, also very different test. Huh? Okay. Uh, so perhaps uh, more modern or newer uh, observation are these observation of gravitational wave that are passing through Earth. Um, and so those started in 2015. Uh, um, this is the observation of the uh, LIGO, uh, of the two LIGO inter interferometers. And this is directly the wave that has been measured. I'm sure you have seen these this things. It's a, it's a wave train of about half a second. And here I'm showing uh, the wave is a complex quantity. Here I'm showing the real part. I'm showing the frequency. And I'm showing the amplitude. Okay. Um, so this waveform has been predicted before being observed, uh, both analytically and numerically. Okay. It has been calculated numerically with simulations and so on, and it, it was before predicted analytically, exactly in this qualitative uh, thing. And this has been identified as a, a, a binary black hole merger. So it's two black holes that are uh, on a circular, quasi-circular orbit for the same mechanism described before. Um, they, have to, they have to merge, and um, this is the type of signal, which is increasing in frequency, but it is also increasing in amplitude, okay? And typically what also you learn from um, many talks and seminars that you have probably seen, um, this is a thing that is composed very early. Let me write here. By an early part, which uh, we indicate as in spiral, okay? Such an early part, 
strictly speaking, might not be here, but this in spiral is what I mentioned before. So you have a circular orbit and you have a small emission of gravitational waves. So the orbit kind of adiabatically readjusts to a smaller radius orbit. And then you go on like this in this catastrophic and dissipative process, okay? This is for self-gravitating uh, uh, for self gravitating system like black holes or neutron star, this has to be described by, by the post Newtonian formula, but it is described by the post Newtonian formulas. But then, as this uh, um, sketch here says, this accelerates. Okay? There is no way to end this. So it's accelerating and accelerating, and you see the, um, the orbit become less and less circular. Okay? So this is a, a progressive process of the collision in which the orbit is less and less um, circular. Um, so if you describe it in, in, a, in, a classic, in classical mechanics with Hamiltonian formulas, you would have a radial momentum that is more and more relevant during the, during the process. This is actually the merger, which is basically what we are observing here. Okay? And conventionally, we may decide to call this peak of the amplitude, which is something that we can clearly identify in the data or in the signal, uh, we can call it the moment of merger. So if you want, is where the amplitude and frequency stop to be monotonically increasing. Okay? We define it this way. Although the merger process is something that is much more, it's process, right? But we could call this T merger. And this corresponds, if you look at simulations, if you look at the theory, this corresponds to a moment in which um, the two horizons merge into one, very distorted horizons, okay? okay. And after that, what you have, um, well, in, you have a black hole for sure, like, it's like a single one, very distorted. And so you have something that is much closer um, to the theory of perturbation of black holes. In this case, it's not non-rotating, so it is rotating, it's a Kerr black hole. Um, but you may think of, being, of describing this um, portion of the signal as due to the way uh, a Kerr black hole vibrates around this um, equilibrium, or, uh, around the Kerr black hole, okay? How the space-time vibrates around a care, um, a care black hole. So care is stationary. Care might also be equilibrium. It's not been fully proven, uh, but uh, Schwarzschild it is very recently in full nonlinearity. Huh? Um, so it's the same as what particle physicists would do. The minimum of the of the uh, sombrero hat, and uh, here is very similar. And so here you would use naturally perturbation theory of black hole to describe this portion of the signal that I didn't really uh, do properly. So it's a high frequency signal, higher than, than the one before. Okay. And it is a damped signal. So it's a higher frequency, the highest frequency is reached there. And it is a damped signal because the amplitude goes down. So this is what it is called ring down. And it is something that uh, uh, was predicted a long time ago by a numerical experiment by Vish Vishveshwara. Um, Chandrasekhar worked a lot on that. There is a book of Chandrasekhar that you may want to read if you're interested in these in this things, um, um, and so on and so forth. So it's something that comes from perturbation theory, um, another perturbation theory, not the post-Newtonian, but, um, but was also understood. So if you want, in this picture, the techniques that one uh, uses typically is actually outside of this, um, of this diagram. You would approach the problem, the two body pro the general, general relativistic two body problem, you would approach it with post Newtonian theory. Then here there's a range in which you can use a mixture of um, um, analytical and numerical relativity result. But uh, really, to do the quantitative prediction, you need numeric relativity. So really solve Einstein equation on the computer. Although this part was before predicted by an approach, by an analytical approach um, 
by the Moore and collaborator that is called effect in one body. So you can predict analytically these things with some hypothesis. Um, and in the end, what you have here uh, is the core perturbation. Okay, so these are the different theoretical calculation approach, if you want, that um, allowed, allowed us to recognize the signal once it was seen in the data, okay? Because this was all known before seeing the data. And this is uh, another event, uh, very famous. So these are two neutron stars. So think about the um, Alcen Taylor pulsar, but millions of years later. At some point, they will be close enough that you will be seeing the last 30 seconds or minute of life of this binary system. And this is instead a spectrogram um, with the frequency increasing. And now, of course, I could not do it, but you have to imagine that the amplitude also increases. So the, the third dimension, the color, is the amplitude, right? Uh, and what, uh, it's a very long signal, very high SNR. Um, and what you are seeing actually here is what we called before. You are seeing the last, the last uh, 30 seconds of an in spiral, okay? You see also the merger here, but actually there was too much noise. It's not very, um, um, it's not very uh, detectable, let's say. And here, just to give you an idea, um, the range of frequency goes um, yeah, from 50 hertz to 500 hertz, which is more or less uh, the sensitivity region um, of in interferometer. So interferometer operates between 20 hertz and say one kilohertz. And it doesn't matter really what precisely um, I'm, I'm, I'm showing here, but you have to think about this course as the sensitivity course of these instruments, like on Virgo and so on. And whatever, uh, and, and, and yeah, here means there's a lot of noise. So this means you cannot see in some sense. Uh, and here you have the maximal sensitivity of the, of the instrument, okay? So let's call it. So this signal happened to, to span uh, a good fraction of the broadband available uh, by the experiment. So compared to this, which instead is much, much more um, focused. Um, masses, right? <laughs> uh, we will learn. Uh, Gravity is about masses uh, and uh, um, mass variation and movements. So this event here, these two black holes were uh, black holes about, um, let me write it here, 30 plus 35 solar masses. This was also quite a, quite a surprise in the sense that uh, you see such uh, large black holes or heavy black holes um, in gravitational waves, we see many of those even more massive. Uh, but from other type of observation, uh, this was a surprise, okay? So there's an entire population of massive black holes that has been revealed by this um, gravitational wave, um, gravitational wave observation. And this is also a binary black hole that is outside our galaxy, of course, whereas the Alcen Taylor pulsar is in our galaxy. Um, here are neutron stars, and um, so these are typical masses of neutron star order, sol or 1.4, 1.5 solar masses, okay? Like these ones, okay, so. One, one star. Um, and why I'm, uh, why I'm telling this? Uh, because uh, as we will see, um, there's a mass scale in all of this. The, um, the higher the mass, the smaller is the frequency. So it's kind of, um, well, for binary black hole is exact. You can scale everything by the mass. There's a scaling variant. And so it doesn't matter what masses you actually model. The model of this waveform is good for any masses. Okay? You just take it and rescale it based on the, on the mass. This is not fully true for a neutron star because they have internal structure. Um, but essentially, you need this range 
to measure neutron star signals. Um, but for binary black hole, the thing uh, depends on the, on, on the particular mass of the, of the binary. So if you have particularly massive binary, if you have supermassive black hole binaries, you have the exact the same signal, exactly the same signal. But this would be shifted to, I don't know, millihertz. Okay? Um, whereas if you have, these are still called stellar mass because they are of stellar origin. You still have stellar mass, stellar origin, a binary black hole, um, then you are fine in this ground based sensitivity window. Okay, so the idea is that we will go through, uh, we will go through um, these topics during the lectures, but we, especially with the tutorial, we will keep an eye on um, this real problem, okay? And we will try to go as close as possible to um, identify the various features, calculate this frequency evolution, for example, understand what are the relevant parameters that, they, that, uh, and that, that parameterize the signals, and so on and so forth. So the exercises in particular will be kind of tailored to um, this type of problem, to, to these to understand the feature of this, of this object and of this observation. Okay, so let me start with some idea on the theory. And I mentioned um, at the beginning um, these results on the 50. I want to give you a flavor of that. Um, Let's start with Einstein equation, Einstein field equation in vacuum. So this is simply the Ricci tensor equals zero. And if you write it down in some coordinate, uh, what you get is um, a long expression. Let, let me write it down. So the first term is actually the box or d'Alembert operator applied to the metric component. Then you have other terms, which I don't know exactly how to describe in word, but let me write them down. And then you have another term here that depends on G and its derivative. So what I've been writing here, I've been, I've been writing the pieces of the Ricci that has the highest derivative, second, okay? <clears throat> and there's a box, and plus there's this combination of second derivative, okay? This combination of second, deri of second derivative, often it is written like this introducing a certain, um, a certain function, big H. Ah, and okay, this, is, this means sim to symmetrize. Eh? So one half. Um, this piece of the, of the um, so this is the highest derivative is called the principal part in, in partial differential equation, okay? So this is the principal part, and this is a non-principal part which contains G and derivative of G in, in, uh, in some, in some nonlinear combination. This is all good and correct. Um, we are free in general relativity to make a gate choice. And one possible gate choice is this. This is called harmonic gauge. And you see from this why I'm doing it. Because if, you, if I do harmonic gauge here, the principal part of the equation is just the box. Which is something nice. So this is naively uh, without um, Without knowing anything, right? We have wave equation for the metric components. 
So this is a starting point uh, that you would take naturally, work in harmonic gauge to define a Cauchy problem for an hyperbolic PDE system, which is not so nonlinear, right? <laughs> this, I mean, there's something fishy here because this is the box with G, right? So you have the metric, the inverse metric. So this is not really linear operator. And of course, we are forgetting about the, the <coughs> non-principal part. But for the e classification, for the well posedness, the non-principal non part doesn't really matter. So all that matters is here. And this is very close to something that we can, we can deal with. And the incredible non-linearity of Einstein equation where they, they're not so incredible, right? It's actually something that is classifiable and it's a quasi-linear PDE system, okay? So something that mathematician, at this level, I haven't said certain things, but um, Naively, at least, this would be the starting point. So we won't do it, but uh, Madame Choquet-Bruha proved that uh, if you take, uh, for instance, harmonic gauge and so on, you can set up an initial value problem, so a Cauchy problem with Einstein equation, uh, essentially using this, and this is well posed. So you have uniqueness, you have existence, uniqueness, of, of the result, which is a very important thing. For the uh, gravitation, uh, so of course these are wave solutions, and it's kind of, yeah. um, there's a, for gravitational wave, there's an alternative, but a sort of equivalent way of um, formulating uh, general relativity. And it's the following. So introduce a new variable that I would call this uh, uh, calligraphic H. And um, this is the um, determinant, the square root of the determinant of the metric times the metric uh, minus the, um, the flat Minkowski metric. Okay. This is not a tensor because there is this. So it's a pseudo tensor. And for those that have read the Landau Lifshitz book, this, this piece here is what Landau, is the, the Gothic metric. Okay, so it's that. And why uh, people have introduced this? Um, because of the following. So, with this notation, if you want, the harmonic gauge is simply the partial derivative of this H. Okay, you can prove this. And the other very interesting thing is that uh, uh, if you now rewrite everything in terms of this variable, what you get is an equation of this type. Now this is uh, full, full GR actually. Not anymore in vacuum. Uh, let's call it TH. Okay, what are, uh, so these are Einstein equations in terms of this variable. Okay, and now let me tell you what these things are. But Timu nu is Timu nu. It's the stress energy of any matter field that you, that you plug in on the right-hand side, okay? TLL is the Landau um, pseudo tensor. This is dependent on, um, well, G and derivative of H, okay? And it's quadratic. And it's called Landau Landau, Lifshitz, how's it called, how's it written, Lifshitz, tensor. 
This th is something that uh, um, it's quadratic in h. So let me write it schematically. It's something like this. Okay, but as the property that uh, minus g t mu nu h partial derivative is zero if you have a uh, harmonic gauge, okay? So it, it is a quantity like that, that once uh, you derive it with partial derivative is automatically zero. And, and that's it. The other people, the other um, symbols we have defined. And why this is interesting? This is interesting because um, this is what we know is the box d'Alembertian in special relativity, okay? So these are the full nonlinear Einstein equation. There is no approximation into this, okay? Written for this particular variable, but in a way that uh, they are in a form that we basically know how to, how to deal with, because this is box, real box, the, the flat box, H equal, right hand side, okay? And where is the trick? Well, the trick is of course here, we have moved the quadratic dependencies into this right hand side term. So it's a kind of, kind of cheating in some sense, but it's a cheating that is useful, okay? So in particular, another property, another um, nice feature of the Sphinx is that the partial derivative and the box made of partial derivative commute. Because everything here is, is, is flat space time and so on and so forth. These are all partial derivative, okay? Which means that in harmonic gauge, if you call this guy here uh, tau mu nu, in harmonic gauge, because of this property, Tau mu nu is conserved. Which is nice, okay? It's conserved through the, uh, the, through partial, through the divergence but given by, by partial derivative, okay? And, and this is very similar to what? This is a very similar theory to Maxwell theory, right? Because you can write it just that with an index less. Now there are some four pi um, here. It's identical, so almost. <laughs> That's what we have realized, right? So you have an index less, but okay, it's something deep. Um, and you have a conserved charge here. You have conserved stress energy tensor, which is nice. Um, how would you solve that? How would you go uh, and, and um, so here, these are the equation of motion, right? And uh, there's a standard uh, green function approach to go and solve, uh, and solve the, box, the, the box equation, okay? So without knowing anything, we could, we could uh, write down the general formal solution to Einstein equation in harmonic gauge by simply introducing the Green function. So the Green function is something that satisfies uh, G uh, some delta, uh, which is minus one, four pi, as you know from electromagnetism. Uh,
function of this type. And the general solution for H mu nu, following, say, the approach of electromagnetism is 4G divided C square. If you bother about the C square, the four-dimensional integral of this green function times the source. But here, um, this, uh, uh, sorry, u here is the retarded time. So it's t minus x minus x prime over c. It's defined this way. So now you would write h as g times the source, integral, four dimensional, but one of the coordinates is t, and you have a delta here, so this cancel, and you have d3x prime, only space, the uh, tau monu, which is our stress energy tensor there, um, as a function of u and x prime, spatial, so uh, divided by x minus x prime. Almost usually you add a homogeneous solution of the equation. This is how mat what mathematician what mathematician tell you. Sorry, you add the solution of the homo of the homogeneous equation. And this is very nice because we have full solved we have formally solved gravity with standard technique that we know from electromagnetism. Does it mean that now the problem is, so, is solved and we have nothing to do? Obviously not, because we have hidden something on the carpet, not, not even so much. Um, of course, this tau, differently from electromagnetism, contains H. Okay. So this is really a formal solution. It's not like electromagnetism that if you calculate this integral, you are done. This is a, fu is a functional of H itself. So we have just hidden the, the nonlinearity there. Okay? But that doesn't mean that this is useless because, well, you know from quantum mechanics, scattering theory, you all the time have this type of formal solution. And you have iterative processes to solve them. So you start with a gas or with the low order approximation for H, you plug it in, you calculate H. You take that H, you plug it in, you calculate the next. You don't know if you're really converging, but this is a, an algorithm to solve this, okay? Uh, by the way, these are called relaxed Einstein field equation, not because they go on holiday, uh, but uh, because the typical approach of, the, we have this, right? This is a sort of additional equation together with that. Huh? So, but the typical approach is to say, okay, let's forget about this. Let's solve for this. And only after, when we have found, uh, when we have found the solution, then we impose the equation of motion and the gauge, which is the same thing in this case. Okay. So they are relaxed because um, the equation of motion are not imposed during the process of the solution typically, but because what you do is to say, okay, I take this, I try to solve this somehow. If I get to a result, then at the end, I um, impose the equation of motion. That's where the relaxed uh, thing comes, comes out. Okay. And the interpretation is, is the usual. So if you have a, a, a space time here with some, uh, with some matter source, so this is time and this is space, uh, what this tells you is that the field or the gravitational wave, if you want, at a, at a certain point here um, depends on the integral of the source 
within this past life cone. Um, at very, so the, this homogeneous solution in the scheme would correspond to an integral on the boundary of this um, cone. It's called the Kir Kirchhoff formula, the standard formula to obtain this solution, um, but typically can be neglected, at least for the first iteration, okay? Okay, how much do I have actually? Uh, still? Ah, two hours in total, okay, okay. Okay, if you want to break, tell me. <laughs> Uh, not now. <laughs> now maybe I go ahead and finish uh, and finish ten minutes before, so then they can relax or whatever. Um, half an hour before. Okay, so I try to finish it up past ten. Okay, so tomorrow we will go and dive into this. Uh, uh, actually, probably, if, if many of you know already weak field, GR, linearized theory, and don't want to hear this again, you can tell me later. And, you know, I just make a very brief recap tomorrow and, uh, and we go on with other topics. Um, but before going into that, so before actually. Uh, yeah, doing the linearized theory, so start some uh, um, some scheme to try to solve those equations, which I remind you again, these are full nonlinear equations. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I want to show you about a, a, an approximate solution and derive the quadrupole formula directly from there. Okay, I will have some. Um, I will make some um, a couple of hypotheses that we may justify tomorrow better. But uh, try to try to try to follow. So so the approximate solution. Uh, the first thing that we would this is some let, let let me list some hypotheses that I think they are reasonable. Um, the first is weak field. What I mean by weak field, I mean the G. I want to approximate something that is very close to um, the Minkowski. Um, in a way that we need to discuss, but we will discuss it tomorrow. Today we, we don't bother about that, okay? Um, this means in particular that if you have this T, tau, sorry, mono of this H variable, where sometimes here, here, and here I skip the indexes just to. Um, um, so in, in this approximation, this tau, which I mean, this is the simplest thing that we would imagine to do, right? And the simple uh, approximation, this tau is, um, there's a G, the determinant, somewhere here. Um, and then there is simply T mu nu of eta. Okay, plus small terms. So what I'm doing, I'm forgetting about all this nonlinearity. These are, um, I say that these are, are higher order. And this, which means at this point is very similar to uh, electromagnetism, right? Because here I don't have H anymore. First iteration. Uh, then there's a slow motion hypothesis. And here I say, okay, the V is a typical char the characteristic velocity of the source, which is still unspecified. Still, I want to take it much smaller than C, okay? Um, which means if I take V over C, this is much smaller than, than one. But V over C can also be a characteristic frequency of the source times a characteristic size of the source 
divided by C, and also this is much smaller than one, okay? So velocity of the source, frequency of the source, size of the source. Um, third hypothesis, so I'm of course I'm going to simplify the thing as much as I can. Um, the third hypothesis could be, okay, uh, I know from electromagnetism that this green function can be well approximated if I go very far away from the source. So let me do it also here, okay? Far from source means um, this is my source R, this is my X prime, this means X. Okay, so this is the vector that I integrate over the source. This is the vector that goes to my uh, field point. And what I mean far from the source is this is much longer than this, which means that I confuse the dashed with the solid. And as a standard formula to do that, um, yeah, X minus X prime, which goes, it, it's the guy there, the denominator um, is R minus n times x prime, okay? Where r is this distance here. And n is the, is the direction. So if you want. <coughs> and together with that, my, um, Retarded time as a simplified expression as well, which is T minus RC, this R, that R, um, plus N X prime over C. Okay. Sometime I, I can call this TR. So it's an approximate retarded time that holds when I'm very far away. And finally, I take the homogeneous solution as to be zero. So the, this means that what I'm assuming is there is no incoming radiation. And the comb. Okay, so with this hypothesis, which are quite strong, let's do, I can calculate this integral rather well using the standard method that we learn in electromagnetism. I'll also restrict myself to spatial indexes for a reason that will, not, will be clear tomorrow. Um, So a j now runs from one to three, and it's not mu nu. So this will be a function of this t r. Uh, well, later. This will be equal, uh, and let me also put g equals c equal one. Sometimes g and c will disappear. I'll put it at the end when uh, it is relevant. So this is four, the three-dimensional integral of uh, tau, okay? But tau is what? It's T, okay? So it's Tij, the stress energy tensor, um, with dependencies Tr plus N times X prime over C and X prime, divided by X modulus of X minus X prime, uh, but here, as you know from electromagnetism, I'm allowed to confuse this difference with this, so this length with this, so it's simply R. But R does not depend on X prime, okay? So this is four over R integral of Tij with, with this argument. Now what I want to do is to start to use um, hypothesis two and three, 
and particular, <coughs> sorry, hypothesis, hypothesis two, a bit systematically, sorry, on the microphone. And I want to expand this argument here into this, um, uh, in, in Taylor form, into this N. So in particular, I will write T i j, or let me write T, just a, any of the components of T i j, huh? um, of T r plus n dot x prime over c. Um, and I also don't write the x prime dependence. It's implicit. And this is T of T r plus n i over x, sorry, n i x i over c, time derivative of t calculated at the rate this um, retarded time, plus it's an exp it's a, an expansion of this type. Okay, you can um, sit for a minute and convince yourself that this is correct. It's the second derivative and the small term here. And uh, why I'm doing this, um, why I'm allowed to do that? Well, I'm allowed to do that because of my item two. And the reason is that each of this time derivative, if you go, for instance, to Fourier, uh, to the Fourier representation, as a term omega. That omega that that is there. Okay. Sorry, my ears are very <laughs> particular, and I always go. So every derivative, every time derivative, essentially carries in the frequency in the in the, in, in the frequency domain, so in Fourier transform, an omega factor, which I assume is small. So to see, and so. I'm perfectly allowed to do this type of, um, of expansion and cut it where I want. So one, if, if you want to see it a bit better, um, you write the Fourier transform of t, which is something like t tilde, e to the minus i omega um, t r plus n at x prime over c. IKX, uh, and um, yeah, and you see that this factor here is something like um, e to the minus i omega t r one minus i omega x times x plus one half i square omega square c square. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of you have done this already. But this is just that the time deriv the derivative in Fourier representation is just a multiplication by omega, okay? And, and these are exactly what I claim it's small, okay? So these are small terms, and so on. Long story short, I am allowed by hypothesis two to expand this function in that way. And of course, what I do, well, I take the leading order, which is one. So um, at the end, what I find is that my h, big H i j, is equal 4 over r, the in integral d3x prime t i j of t r x prime. So I have significantly simplified the solution. And you see that the solution decay as one over r. And the nice thing is that this is an integral on the stress energy tensor of the matter, spatial component, with the um, retarded time, which of course is direct. 
But the expression is very manageable now. And oh, okay, let's try from here. And we can continue a bit. And as I promised before, uh, you solve, and then you, imp you impose the equation of motion. Okay, so let's do it. They were they are written there. So it's this um, diver flat divergence of tau equals zero, which means uh, in our case zero, the um, divergence of t mu nu. Okay, which is eta mu nu uh, derivative nu um, t, uh, say alpha mu, no, I'm um, sorry, this is alpha, yeah. Which means I have an equation for alpha, these are four equations, huh? I have an equation for alpha equals zero, so this is the time derivative of t zero zero plus the spatial derivative t0i equals zero. This is the alpha equals zero equation. And then I have the alpha equal i equation. And this is t0k uh, plus i uh, tki equals zero. So this is how these four equations break down in one and three. And those I can combine. So what, what, what do I want? Well, I want to express something like the density of the matter, like right, of a perfect fluid, in terms of this Tij thing. Okay, that's why that's why I'm doing uh, doing this trick. So I can derive the uh, alpha equals zero um, equations, and then substitute the other. So this is minus double time derivative of t zero zero plus dt dk. Slight change of notation for later. Um, these can commute. So this is dk dt, right? And then I can use, so this is the time derivative of alpha equals 0. And now here, since this commute, I can use the alpha equal 1 equation to get two times derivative of t0,0 zero zero plus um, k derivative with respect to k spatial, spatial derivative with respect to l, t, k, l. A, I change a bit the, the indexes because I have t, i, j there, but this is the thing, okay? So these are the equation of motion. And now I'm going to, integ to multiply by, um, xi and xj, and I'm going to integrate as well. So if you do that, you have second derivative in time, the integral d3x of t0,0 zero zero, xi xj, yeah, equal the um, integral of this term here, multiplied by xi, xg. So integral um, dk dl, that's why I've changed the, the name of the indexes, because they, they need to be different from this i and j. Okay, and now I have to do this integral. <laughs> um, the way to do this integral, which is like this. Huh? Uh, the way to do this, this integral is, is, uh, is the following. Uh, the idea is to identify total divergences. This, all these integrals are made like that. Uh, these are, this is a volume integral, and here there are derivatives. So what you do is you identify total derivatives, use the divergence theorem, throw them away, and move the derivative, um, and move the derivative on the other side. 
So um, quickly, this is, uh, I can write this as k derivative of tk l xi and xj minus the other term. So the derivative of l tk l uh, d k d x dj this is now total divergence so this becomes an integral on the surface but if the surface is far away from t from this from the region of the of the uh, from the region of this of of Okay, the source is compact support. This is, I never say that, but the source must be compact support, okay? Um, and so you can do this trick. You can take a large, a large uh, uh, surface and um, throw away all these terms. And this is instead easy because this is d, d k x d i times this times another factor like that. So here, what you get are delta function of this type. Okay, delta kj, so it's like a dx, dz, and so on and so forth, okay? Here you have another derivative. So you, you repeat these things again, okay? So again, you write it as a total derivative. There's a term that goes away. Um, there are the derivative of the remaining, so this would be um, delta k i x i plus delta um, k j x i, right? This gives you this term. So now when you do the total derivative here, you have to derive this x, and so you get delta again. The result of all of this, which I'm not writing, just try by yourself to do it. It's two times, these are two terms like that, the integral of t i j. Now I'm almost done because I go back there. And there I have an integral of Tij. So here I can continue. Here I have been using so far the equation of motion, right? I have a four here, I have a two there. I think it should sum up like to a two, and I put here a G and a C4. I have one over R, and then I have this integral of Tij calculated at the retarded time. But the integral of Tij is the second derivative in time of T0, 0 multiplied by x and x which is the moment of inertia. So if you call this rho, this is the usual uh, tensor. Um, so you can call it rho, the t0, 0. It's OK. So I have to put the second derivative. Of rho x i x j in this case. But here, this guy here is the quadrupole moment. Calculated at t r. So this is the celebrated quadrupole formula. Derived, uh, derived directly from the Einstein equation in harmonic gauge in this particular formulation uh, under a bunch of hypotheses, which are one to four, which essentially make but a way to summarize this hypothesis is that I'm requiring that 
Um, it's a perturbation of Minkowski, and that the source is compact support and slow. Okay. There was an important part here where there was this um, approximation. I would say, okay, we keep the leading order terms. Uh, we could have, of course, kept more and more terms. And this is a valid sort of perturbative expansion that if you go through it, um, you have more and more terms, which are uh, multiples of higher order than the quadruple. So this is a essential formula to understand uh, any anything in um, uh, any observation, okay? And let me make a few comments before stopping. Okay, first the easy part. The easy part and the funny part is the following. You can do dimensional analysis of that formula. Uh, you discover something interesting that H is of the order. You have to shuffle some terms. So you start from G, C4, D, which is the distance, mass times the velocity square, which is the second derivative of the quadruple. Um, this, if you manage the terms and put, put inside the, the typical size of the source, um, the mass of the source, typical mass of the source, M, and the typical velocity of the source, you get a formula like that. Okay, but simply by dimensional analysis. Uh, and this tells you something interesting. So this is the velocity square, okay? So high speed, it's a good point to have strong gravitational wave. This quantity here is the uh, alpha of the Schwarzschild radius. It's also called self-gravity of, of, uh, of an object. Or of, yeah, of an isolated object, okay? So it tells you how, is, how strong is the gravity at the surface of the, sor of the star, for example. Uh, this formula tells you that strongest gravity is, is good, also that it, it scales with one over D, okay? This is we knew. Why this is interesting? Because every single term of this uh, equation breaks every single hypothesis that we have used to derive the formula, okay? So slow motion, no. Uh, self, self gravity is completely neglected because G is flat space time in our formula, okay? So, no. Nonetheless, the formula is correct <laughs> and it has been proven by this way. Uh, but you see, uh, uh, this thing suggests that you need somehow to go beyond that. If you want to describe uh, black holes, um, if you want to describe neutron stars, relativistic objects, you need strong gravity. and you need high velocity. Okay. This is what motivates uh, going into complicated formulas like post-Newtonian and so on. So, um, you will use this formula for calculating the uh, gravitational wave from um, circular binary. This is what you will be doing today or tomorrow. Uh, in principle, what you use is completely wrong. Uh, but it gives you the right result. Uh, and it has been proven that in the end, uh, it's the low, le leading order result that, um, uh, so some numbers. So if you have um, a car crash, and you're looking at the safety distance of one meter, H through this formula is something like, um, 
10 to the minus 43. H doesn't have a dimension. It's the strain. Huh? Uh, if you have a supernova explosion and you're looking at the safety distance of um, uh, 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 10 kiloparsec, H is order 10 to the minus 17. If you have a binary black hole merger and you're looking at the safety distance of uh, 100 megaparsec, um, you have 10 to the minus 21. These are typical numbers, very small numbers. Gravitational wave are generated by some of the strongest events that you can find in the, uh, in, the, in the universe. But when they reach us, since these are cosmic events, they are very, very tiny variation in our clocks or in our lasers and so on and so forth. Uh, this H, we will see uh, tomorrow that what an interferometer measures so this is the formula, uh, pen and paper, uh, you know, the, the formula that you have to remember. This H is basically the relative variation of length that an interferometer measures, okay? So if you look at these numbers, you are measuring variation of distance, the, the, the sub, uh, subatomic over length of kilometers. This is the experiment, experimental uh, challenge, okay? A um, few more um, comments on this. Let me find it. Start. Um, yeah, perhaps a technical comment here about this. Um, about this expansion. I want to show you in another simplified way what we have done, okay? So what we have done is basically to try to solve what we've done at this step that was in this blackboard. Um, We have started from the wave equation, say h equals zero. <coughs> and think about a scalar wave equation. Um, what you have typically, these are solution that uh, it's spherical symmetry, so far from the source, they go down like one over r. So let me put uh, one over r in front. These are function in general of the retarded time. And we have done something like that. We have taken this H, we have T minus RC, this retarded time. And in this expansion that was in this blackboard, what we have done was something of this type. So we have approximated this to a function uh, in, in this way. where I'm putting the C. So this was our approximation in small omega was this low velocity approximation. So comment on the uh, low velocity approximation. So we said that, yeah, it, 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 each time derivative is small, there's a factor of omega, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is, um, um, and this is an, an expansion of this type, okay? Very good. But look at R now. As you go in with the series, the powers of R are increasing. So that series that we have used in, is a series um, like that, where you have some coefficients, Cn. Um, 
the velocity to the certain power, but this Cn coefficients depend on r. And they are getting larger for larger r. So this is an example of a syntactic series that you know everyone knows about. Um, and this tells you that this is a, an approximation that holds only in the near zone. So when you go far away from the source, this is a bad series and diverges, okay? So this low velocity approximation that we have used, uh, it's really something that is badly defined if you are away from the source, which is by the way also where we have used it. So another issue of that derivation, okay? Um, but it's essential an expansion um, on Um, re retarded effect. So these are all the same thing. Every time that you expand for uh, slow velocity, um, you are expanding something that in the, is, is barely defined far away. And every time you are neglecting the retarded effect, Again, you are doing such small velocity expansion, sort of, huh? just to give you an idea. Um, and this is, if you think about it, it's like approximating the box of H as the Poisson. So you say, I'm throwing away uh, effects of deriv time derivatives, the cares factors of one over C, okay? So this is kind of the basis to start for an post on approximation, which we will see in the, in the next lecture. But already see, already now, sorry, you see that in this type of approach, there could be some serious issue, and it's something that needs to be um, uh, well, done very carefully and uh, very, very properly. Um, okay, so I think I will stop here. Um, I will tell you what we have not discussed. So we have discussed a bunch of things. Um, they're more or less all correct. Uh, in certain part, I've been very naive, just to get to the result quickly, so that in the afternoon you can start to use some of these formulas. Uh, you will be given, of course, correct formulas and so on, but you see where they come from. Um, and from tomorrow, uh, we will look a bit more formally um, to uh, linearize weak, weak field, linearized theory where all these things are defined. We we'll talk about how uh, one can generate gravitational wave essentially using this, um, yeah, this formalism. One, we can talk about how, what's the effect, how, how do the gravitational wave propagate, um, and what's their effect on test masses, okay? So for example, what we have not discussed today that we do want to discuss I have not discussed gauge choices. Well, except except for the fact that I say that this is in a spheric, in, in, our, um, in harmonic gauge that I have not really discussed further. Um, I have not say uh, what are the, the degrees of freedom that are in this. Um, we will discuss a bit more in detail because there's a subtle issue which is similar to electromagnetism, by the way. This is also in a given gauge and there's still gauge freedom. It's the same here. Um, I have not discussed uh, energy and how energy is transported and so on and so forth. And this also requires some more um, careful, uh, careful discussion. But this was just a crash thing, um, a crash introduction, just to put on the, on the blackboard the, all the relevant things, the order of magnitude and this important formula that you will be using to interpret all this um, or to understand all this observation. Okay, thank you for listening and see you tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs>